You know, one question that's often asked of a pastor or a chaplain, have I committed the unpardonable sin? A person who is seeking wants to know if they have gone too far. And as we're going to see, the Bible warns that such a sin can cost a person his promised eternal life. Today we're going to show what the scriptures reveal about the difference between a sin that does not lead to death and one that does. We read about that mystery when the Apostle John encouraged us to pray for sinning church members, but he added the distinction that's confused people for hundreds of years between a sin unto death and a sin not unto death. Listen to these words from 1 John 5, 16 and 17. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit the sin, not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death, he said. I do not say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin. And there is sin not leading to death. So how do we know which sin is forgivable and which is not. As we approach the end of the age when judgment will fall on all people and all nations, how can we, you and I, be sure of salvation and the promise of escaping God's day of wrath? The Creator God of man and the universe has bestowed an incredible gift on His children, and that is unquenchable faith and hope. Every day, the printed and broadcast news delivers more reasons for doom and gloom. And yet, millions of Christians around the world have the spiritual and emotional strength to endure and even offer thanks in the face of disintegrating law and order. You may ask, how is that possible? Well, I want you to listen to the voice of King David, who was surrounded by his enemies, even of his own household, and he believed in God and he trusted him in times of anguish and grief, as written in Psalm 118, 13 to 14. I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. You see, David had his faults like all of us. He was a sinner, perhaps even more so since he committed adultery and murder. Could either one of those sins be unforgivable? After all, Matthew 5.19 declares this, Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. At this point, Jesus was speaking of the law or the prophets, and he equates lying and cheating and even murder as grounds for losing rewards and position in the kingdom of heaven. But he doesn't condemn the person as unpardonable. And as we dig deeper into this mystery of the two types of sin, we'll discover a vital clue to King David remaining a man after God's own heart. I want you to look at 1 John 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you're familiar with the story, the prophet Nathan came to David to show him that his adultery with Bathsheba and then his arranging the murder of her husband was known by God. And too often, a person who is given a position of great power, such as a king or a president or even a military leader, believes themselves to be above the law. Unfortunately, today that is often the case. But David got the message and his cry reached the ear of God. Now, Psalm 51 is called the prayer for pardon and confession of sin. Here's verses 1 through 4. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from sin. 
for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. The believer in the one true God knows that he or she can never be perfect. For that's the reason Jesus, the one perfect man, had to pay the blood ransom to cleanse the humble confessor of transgressing, sinning against the Creator. So what then is God's reaction to one that David describes as having a broken and contrite heart? Well, hear the words of the Lord in these three scriptures. Hebrews 8.12 for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. In Isaiah 43, 25, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. And in Ephesians 1, 7-8, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. So, as we read earlier in the program, all unrighteousness is sin. And there is a sin not leading to death. And yet, when the sinner confesses his or her transgression and he humbly seeks pardon and mercy, God, who cannot lie, promises and delivers forgiveness. And so the believer's entry into eternal life remains sealed with the presence of the Holy Spirit indwelling the Holy Spirit within the person, and the second death will have no power over that person forever. But now we come to another part of this enigma, the mystery of the unpardonable sin. If sin is sin and deserves death, but can be forgiven, and yet there is a sin that cannot be blotted out, then there appears to be a conflict within the Bible. And when we go to the scriptures, we'll discover that the answer is really not as difficult as it first appears. Since the Bible was inspired by the Creator, there can be no errors or contradictions in the scriptures. He originally inspired to be read and written for us. John 10, 35 clearly says the scripture cannot be broken. And perhaps being a believer puts one in a lesser category of guilt. No, for God is not a respecter of persons. This is what the Expositor Bible Commentary says. Our status as children of God does not change the basic definition of sin, nor does it alleviate our moral responsibility. Sin is always lawlessness, whether committed by a child of God or anybody else. Where then in the unbreakable scripture can we learn of the sin that can be classified as unpardonable and can lead to eternal death? Well, the Apostle Paul began to provide that answer when he wrote in his letter in Hebrews 10 verses 26 to 27. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation judgment, and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Now, who is Paul speaking to? One may hear the knowledge of the truth by watching a program like this, but has not yet as accepted Christ's sacrifice as payment for their sins. Is that person the unpardonable sinner? Or is there more to defining one who is destined to be consumed in judgment fire? Well, let's just see who was in the audience to hear the reading of Paul's letter. We find that in Hebrews 10, 29. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood to the covenant by which he was sanctified, that is, set apart a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace. 
You see, only a believer who accepts the ransom of Jesus' blood for sanctification and then rejects that sacrifice by deliberately returning to a life of sin finds that there is no more sacrifice remaining for them. The Holy Spirit of God that indwells only in the believer has been insulted and blasphemed. And when Jesus had healed a man who was possessed by a demon, the Pharisees knowingly, falsely accused him of healing the man by the power of Satan. And Jesus personally warned the Pharisees that blasphemy again in this age or in the age to come, speaking of our time, what is exactly the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? Now we can be in danger of committing the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit if we know God has accomplished something through the power of his Spirit and yet we intentionally attribute it to the working of Satan. The Holy Spirit is the power of God. It's how he works to accomplish his will. And so <clears throat> to reject the working of his Spirit is to not just reject his identity, but to reject his very power, work, and nature. Someone who has actually committed blasphemy against the Spirit has no desire to repent, and so cannot be forgiven. Hebrews 6, 4, 6 records this fearful warning. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. So, does this mean that if in a single fit of despair or anger a saved believer turns again to sinning against God, that he'll lose salvation and eternal life? William Barclay, a renowned Scottish minister and professor of divinity, comments on 1 John 5, 16-17 that we began the message with, and he says this, If he, a believer, allows himself again and again to flirt with temptation and to fall, on each occasion, the sin becomes easier. And if he thinks he escapes consequences, on each occasion, the self-disgust, the remorse, and the regret become less and less. And in the end, he reaches a state where he can sin without a tremor. It's precisely that which is the sin leading to death. Now, there are a few exceptions, such as the coming Antichrist and the false prophet, but the sin leading to death, that unpardonable sin, generally refers to converted Christians who, through the process of repentance, accepting Christ's sacrifice, baptism, and with the laying on of hands, have received the gift of the Holy Spirit. In other words, they have already been sealed and made a part of the kingdom of God. <clears throat> But then after a period of time in which they walked on the right path, led internally by the Holy Spirit speaking to them, they began ignoring the warnings that they're drifting away and neglecting the precious calling. And then they make a deliberate decision to deny Jesus and the Holy Spirit and to abandon the road that leads to eternal life. They don't endure to the end spoken of in Matthew 24, 13, and therefore they're guilty of a blatant violation of God's will. And here's the message that Peter taught to the early Christians and which comes down to us this very day. 2 Peter 2, verses 20 to 21 says this, For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world, through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. The unforgivable sin. This category of individuals refuses to repent and return and obey God, rejecting his offer of eternal life in his kingdom. Instead, they will die the second death, perishing in the lake of fire, Revelations 20, verses 14 and 15. 
And here's a final note. If you fear that you have committed the unpardonable sin and are unsure, then you haven't done so. And here's why. It is important to note that this is not the same as stumbling or going through a time of weakness in our life. That can happen to people, but they can repent and get back on the path of God's way. To fall away is a much more conscious rejection of Jesus Christ's sacrifice and making a conscious decision to embrace a sinful way of life. And someone who comes to this point fully understands the consequences of what he or she is doing, but simply doesn't care, maybe doesn't believe, and will certainly not change. And so here's a summary of the matter. Yes, it is possible for someone who has received the Holy Spirit to deliberately and willfully decide he or she no longer wants to follow God's way of life. And it is also possible for someone to willingly decide to reject God's way without receiving the Holy Spirit. We're speaking here, for instance, of the beast and the false prophet of Revelation 19, verse 20. For those, the choice between eternal life or the second death in the lake of fire has been made. And there is no return. There's no second chance. And now we say again, don't miss any of these messages and search this site for more messages on salvation the dead in Christ, the tribulation, truth about hell, and many other valuable programs. The speakers and staff of Through the Gathering Storm will continue to bring the truth of the living word to a dying world searching for answers. And remember to visit our podcast at throughthegatheringstorm.info. I'm Chaplain R.T. Byron praying to the Lord Jesus Christ that you and all your loved ones will enjoy a blessed life in his care. Hallelujah, 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 poop.